First impression, is this a credible website? You say no? Yes? Yes. Yes? No? Chuck? Haven't made up my mind yet. No, I haven't made up mine. Haven't made up my mind. Okay, the truth is you probably have. Research shows that when they analyze people's information-seeking behavior, I'm an information scientist, that most people make a determination about credibility on any web resource within one-tenth of a second. And research further shows that the longer you stare at it, when you say, you're actually trying to confirm your initial impression. So we've been trained, so uh, this is Dr. Chuck Curran, so I can pick on him for a moment because he comes from the information science. We've been trained, Dr. Wiggins, Professor Wiggins has been trained to be skeptical. Right? This is our job. This is what we've been trying to do. But by and large, what's happening when you look at what people do, they look at this and they say, is, is it? By the way, this is Syracuse.com. It is the official website of the Syracuse Post Standard, which is the newspaper in Syracuse, New York. And the reason I know it's credible is because it's showing snow. <laughs> <laughs> now, the reason I bring this up, the reason I want to give this as an example is this is what's really easy to happen with fake news, right? One thing, so why, if we're going to, and, and we have to be very careful, so I'm going to just totally take the last hour and ask you to do something different. If we were to describe intentions, why, behind fake news stories, things that we can not verify, that are full of opinion, that are full of language. What are some of the intentions that we can anticipate? Why are people putting out fake news? Producing. Profit, right? So one of them, I think there was a story, where was it that the, was it in um, Ukraine? That where they were producing, there was like one city producing huge amounts of news stories. Okay. Yes. Okay. It was just referred to. Macedonia. Macedonia, thank you. All right, and so the idea was, we're not assuming that they're trying to push an election one way or the other. We're trying to get clicks, because clicks leads ads, leads to Google payment, right? Um, Zach was talking about other reasons, right? The idea that it's propaganda. We're trying to move someone's opinion one way or, or verify, even show that we're one of a clan, right? Look, I'm not going to verify this, but by sit, passing along, I'm declaring that I am, right, left, in for everywhere. Now, the other intention, and the one that I think we need to get to, is the idea that what we're trying to do is undermine truth to begin with. That part of the reason that you're looking at this and trying to figure out is because you've just been tuned for an hour not to trust what you see. Right? A lot of <coughs> higher education is about making you skeptical. I see some folks from my 202 class, right, so Pretty much this entire semester has been, don't trust anyone. Right? And so it creates this point where it's like, I don't know what to trust anymore. What is verifiable? What isn't? Right? When Trump says CNN is fake news, <coughs> what's he trying to say? Is he saying, I've gone through and I've tried to verify every piece of this information and I find logical inconsistencies on a regular basis? Or is he trying to say, don't pay attention to them? Pay attention to this one. So what I want to now move to, and what we're really talking about in terms of undergraduate leadership, is it's not just the idea of making you skeptical. Don't just walk away and say, all right, it's, we can't solve this problem. I want to begin talking about what do we do about this. So we have a couple of different options, right? What are we going to do? So part of what we've been, why we're here today is that the university has identified that, how do I get these up, by the way, light ones? Oh, you... <laughs> really? No, all right, that, but that would be cool, the clappers. Okay. We want undergraduates in this university to not simply hear about it, write it down, but we want to figure out if you guys can change it. And there's some opportunities, we're gonna talk about it in a little bit. We have Magellan scholarships where you can actually get research funding, I think it's a couple of thousand dollars to work with faculty mentors to go out and do research around it. There's an option to graduate with distinction in leadership so that when you graduate, we can recognize you as a leadership. And that a lot of the ways of getting there, community service and public service. So let's talk about now that we've heard it, and Professor Wiggins has, has brought it up, what are we gonna do about it? 
And so to do that, I want us to walk through the concept of a project. Okay, what do we do? What are you going to do about this? Okay, what are the main problems? What's the question? What is the overarching question? Right. And what, what would you say that is? I don't know. That's why I'm asking you. What's the question? Oh, I'm sorry. The question is, okay, if fake news is an issue, right? And what we've seen is that fake news has a longstanding... We, we haven't, you know, the moniker may be new, but the issue of what journalists do, how people interpret it, intentionality, what we're dealing with is, I believe, an intentional misrepresentation of what's happening, right? It's the idea of either through part or whole to misrepresent a situation, whether it be a political situation or what separates it from the mistake. Correct. It's different from mistake. It's different from mistake. So there is some intention here. And so what we worry about, am I doing all right? Yeah. Okay. What we worry about is, all right, we talked in the description, targeted communities. So what I want to do when we're thinking about critics, because you just asked the right point, which is, what is this question again? So, uh, um, let's talk about who the community is that's affected. And it doesn't have to be the same. If you were to say, we believe that fake news is an issue. We believe that this intentional misrepresentation of facts and rep et cetera is a problem for people making decisions. Give me a community that you care about. Give me a group of people, an institution, maybe a, 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 an area that you care about making the right decision, that you think fake news is going to impact. All right, so this campus. So one potential population here that what we want to worry about is, we could say, great, I got one that doesn't work at all. We could say one of the targeted community is the campus. Okay, so what are we worried about in terms of the campus? Okay, so we're supposed to be in the education business, right? And so what we could say is in the fake news world, this is fake news <laughs> compromises or at least is against the goals or values of this campus. We're supposed to be about truth. We're supposed to be about education and understanding. And the promulgation of fake news around the world is somehow compromising that. So we can make that statement. Give me another potential population. Who do you care about? Okay, so we could talk about the media. And what are we worried about in terms of the media? What is the impact that fake news has upon the media? Takes your money. I'm sorry, say it again? So it undermines your credibility and takes your money. Okay, so two of those, right? So one is, it's sort of, you know, one bad apple. That if what, we're, what we have is a situation, thank you, sir, where if people keep equating things that are demonstrably false with things that aren't, eventually we will start to question all those sources. Just like <coughs> I bring up the newspaper site from Syracuse and you suddenly go, well, I don't know anymore. And the reason we don't know anymore is because, first of all, that site, I can bring it back up, doesn't actually say, hi, I'm the newspaper for Syracuse. But even then... Do we trust the newspaper from Syracuse? I mean, once again, I'm from New York. We have the New York Post and the New York Times. We rarely confuse the two, but they're both newspapers. So, and then, Zach, you brought up another one, which is not only are we talking about potentially creating confusion in the market, but that confusion in the market can have financial consequences. That, in fact, if I'm an advertiser and I want eyeballs on this, I'll go to the thing that's most clickable, not the thing that is most verifiable and true. Give me a personal community. Who in your life are you worried about being misled by fake news? My kid. All right. Right? Yes. So it turns out we have in the audience today a teenager. He's going to hate me for this. <laughs> That's my son, Andrew. <laughs> He's shadowing me for, for today, and he's sitting there going, oh, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Andrew! What? What's fake news? <laughs> news that is not real, that is misleading people. Do you care? 
Not really. <laughs> oh, wow. no, that's important, right? Yeah. Not really. Matt, why do you not care about fake news? Which is fine. I'm just because it's not really affecting me too much because I don't look at the news. So we have a teenager, and what we're saying is this is someone that we might want to affect, but we have to deal with more than just, well, Andrew, let me tell you what fake news is and to be careful because you're going to be sitting there having the same conversation that we sat down and said, anything. Like, this is why English is important in your life, right? It's just, whatever. Give me another one. Oh, sorry. Deliberative bodies like legislatures who make decisions that affect lots of people, if they're acting on news that is not true, then there can be negative consequences of that. And as far as individuals are concerned, the vote, voters, if they act on fake news... Did I just spell that, Pardon? Okay, sorry. No, I can't spell it. I'm just looking in the back. So. Uh, individual voters who vote on the basis of fake news make decisions on the basis of fake news. So this can lead to policy which has very direct yes. impact. Yes. Including, by the way, on 15-year-olds. <laughs> right? So what I'm trying to do is what, what I'd like us to walk through is to begin thinking about what we can do. And one of the things that we often do when we're talking about different proposals is, that, is the idea that we're going to fix the problem. And unless we start with who has the problem? How do we operationalize the problem? Then the solutions we come up with are going to be very different. The solutions that legislatures have versus the solution the teenager has versus the solution the campus has versus the open media, they're going to be different potential solutions. So let's talk then about, in terms of the background of this, we did a little bit of that. Now, Professor Wheaton gets up. He teaches journalism. He has a perspective around journalism. What are some other potential perspectives that we might want to consider for background? So I know that we have people here from multiple majors. So do I have a non-journalism, a non-information science person in the room? Where are you from? Right? I'm Jacob. I'm an anthropology major. Perfect. Is there an anthropology angle to fake news? I would say so. Okay, can you think of what is, if you were to think about the values of anthropology, right? Where does fake news become problematic? Well, anthropology is the study of humans. So uh, basically, like, maybe something comes out that says this is more common in one race. Just, no, no, you know, yeah, that's, absolutely. That's, the, the, that's obviously. False. So you could imagine looking at anthropologists, and I apologize for my spelling, and fake news. <laughs> All right, you want to fix that by the time you graduate. <laughs> but, <laughs> the problem with fake news is it may lead to this misrepresentation. And in fact, this is something we see all the time. Is chocolate good for you or bad for you? Is wine good for you or bad for you? Right? Yeah, right. What day is it? Right? Because the latest report comes out. Because if you're doing a really great job in anthropology, you spend all this time, you get a degree, you have expertise, etc. You realize that something like are Swedish people, your example, are Swedish undergraduates more attractive than US undergraduates, that you would never do a study that came out and said, yes, right? Because it's you would go through. Let's define and operationalize this. How do we justify it? Is there a set of theories that help us work on it? In other words, you write this huge article book, and then it gets picked up by Syracuse.time, the state, whatever, and they look through it and they go, yeah, we can condense that down to they're pretty. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, but why are they doing it? I mean, this is another thing, not to impinge upon the um, motives of my journalism colleagues, but in very legitimate New York Times, CNN, right? it's, it's, it's the 11 o'clock news, if it bleeds, it leads view, what's the art of the headline? Why do they come up with pithy headlines? To get ratings. Right. Or to attention, you can do whatever, but there is a deliberate attempt to, once again, 
We could use the word manipulate, but we could certainly use the idea of target. And so back to the intentionality becomes part. All right. The anthropologist who finds a skeleton and says it's 10,000 years old will make more money off that than the one who finds one that's 10 weeks old. And if you look at the whole discussion around climate change, why is climate change in question? Well, these researchers are getting grants for it, so clearly they're going to find climate change as a problem. Right? And smoking cessation. Why are people calling against smoking cessation? Well, clearly, who is funding that and what's their intention? Right? Intentionality in trying to get it. Once again, talking about the obligation of how we report it, we always understand there's this. All right. So we've got a background. This. We know this is a complex problem. This is more than just lies. This isn't exactly propaganda. We've talked about potential. We know that when we talk about the question and goals, we need to know about the audience. Now, the other thing is, let's talk about what we can do about this. All right, so um, I'm going to pick on, well, let's pick on ourselves. On campus, what can we do? What projects, what systems, what activities, what could we do to try and counter fake news on campus in the life of an undergraduate student? What kinds of tasks can we do? What was it, I'll, I'll make this easier, what was it that Professor Wiggins was doing when he was going through that Breitbart article? Let's see, teach people how to uh, verify sources. Okay, so we've got the idea of some sense of instruction. Kind of makes sense because we're in a university which is kind of about instruction. So we could talk about that as sort of a, a literacy effort or an education campaign. Okay. So in terms of, let's take that one for a moment. Let's assume <coughs> that people just don't have the skills to, to filter. All right? Or first of all, are we willing to assume that? Even for the benefits of, I'll give you another slice of pizza so we can move on. <laughs> Zach, you're a doctoral student, you don't get to play. <laughs> right. All right. But that's actually interesting, right? Because there's a narrative that's going on right now that if you looked at the previous election, there's a narrative that says fake news was responsible for Trump's election, for depending on what election you want to get at, what, what result you want to get out of it, it's because people didn't know better. So, all right, instructions one way. So let's take this. Let's say that what we've done is we've identified undergraduates. And by the way, we can do this. Undergrads are, you know, we, we got the fake news background we just talked about. We have the sort of research question or study, which is can we help undergraduates, right? So, all right, this is the fake news discussion. Research question is can we sort of improve Yes, just language. Please. Uh, improve the navigation of fake news. All right. Okay. Right. Whether that's identification, whether it's seeking it out, whatever. All right. Nothing to get rid of. Right. Project goals are to help people navigate them. So these may be collapsing in, which is fine. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at using instruction as a way of doing that. So we're going to have more of these. What kinds of things could we do to, what kinds of ways in which we could do instruction? Please. I, I just have a question. Yeah. Is campus is pretty broad, so is that in regards to like instruction on the undergraduate level, or is that in student media? Like, what, how are we defining fake news on campus? That's a good question, right? Because, but the thing is, precision, 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 precision. When we just got talking about is sometimes fake news issues, they're not precise. And now what we knew in, in addressing the issue is precision. Are we worried, for example, of students promulgating fake news? Are we worried about them utilizing the classroom? Are we worried about formal instruction? Are we worried about informal instruction in campus life? So we do need to begin to come down and say, okay, where is it? So give me, so, so give me an example. What do you want to take on for this exam? Um, instruction. Right, but, but, all right, in terms of... Okay, the professor instructing the students with fake news as a source. 
Okay, so what you're so is, could I rephrase that just to make sure I get it? That what we want to prevent are instructors, in essence, bringing fake news into an instructional setting. Yeah. So you're worried about the quality of instruction you get from the yes. That's cool. Mm -hmm. I like that one a lot. <laughs> right? Because this because the standard answer, and you're probably really tired of it, is Oh, you poor undergraduates, you don't know anything. We have to educate the hell out of you. And you're sitting there going, yeah, but if you're pushing this crap on us, what are you really doing? Yeah. All right. Part well, of my we've language. also heard testimony in here that fake news doesn't really matter. Okay. And so it seems to me that what we want to discover is what is the nature of the fake news and what kinds of decisions are made on the basis of fake news. If, for example, the, I'm going to pick in a, a department, Department of Social Work says the, the employment rate of graduates is 90%. If it turns out it's 40% and people flock to the degree because they think they're going to get a job and they aren't, that's fake news that led to a decision that may be a negative one for that person. So it seems to me hmm. fake news is only a, a real problem if people make decisions on the basis of it and uh, error as a result. Very good. So part of this comes back to, once again, how are we defining this? And so what I heard, for example, was the intention of the person putting it out, and what I just heard was the addition of the impact, negative impact it has on the population. And great example, which is on a campus, we being videotaped. Certain disciplines have had exactly that problem, where we have We've rosied up our employment picture and turns out not so good because what happens is we say you're all employed. What we do is we employ you for a month when they're doing the ratings and then we fire you all and we say we had 100% employment. By the way, I wish that was not a true example, but it is. All right, but I, I, so I want to come back to this. So what we're talking about now is we've got some background. We're talking about defining this, and this is iterative. As you're thinking about this, this is going to be iterative. Raising more questions. This is where, once again, talking about, say, the Magellan Scholarship, it's supposed to be iterative, looking for a faculty mentor to help you work with it. On the, um, and I'm going to, in a second, bring you up at least, so even with the graduating with distinction, whether it's community service, what have you, there's a mentor to help you work through the iterations of this. So, we're talking about on, on campus undergraduates, but really we're talking about what they're getting from faculty. And fake news may be it. We may want to broaden it from, you know, so what I just started with. What's very interesting is when we have it on the screen and you're able to click through and click through and click through, you can talk about technical solutions for that. But when it's me up here doing this, did you ever wonder where I got that one-tenth of a second thing? Did I give you my citation for that? Did you drag find where that citation goes? Can we, in essence, click through, click through, click through? It's a very different situation when you're in a, a real-time classroom than when you're in, you know, browsing and information, even in an online classroom. So this is kind of interesting because what I'm hearing is the instruction, what we need to worry about is the quality instruction, but we also need to worry about the instruction for and in preparation of faculty. So what can we do? Well, I guess I could. Another issue I thought of with that is you can't really control where faculty are getting their news outside of class mm -hmm. and bringing it into the classroom. So? so well, that would be impossible to even do anything about because you can't necessarily control a professor's media time. But you can. I, mean, I, I, I want to be real clear here. So I'm a, I'm a geek and technologist. Uh, if I may ask, are you a, uh, an undergraduate currently? Yes. Uh, senior, junior? Sophomore. So two years ago, you were in a high school. Okay. May I ask? In South Carolina? Okay. Did you use technology in the, in the classroom? If you decided that you wanted to go visit any website you ever dreamed of, could you? No. Why? Because of restrictions. So? On the Wi Fi. Right. And why were they there? Well, I was at a Christian school, so yeah. for probably illicit right. reasons. Let me let me embarrass, school, let, so. let me embarrass my son for a moment. Hey Andrew. <laughs> yes. You're in a middle school. Yeah. What middle school are you want? Middle Glen Middle School. And they gave you an iPad. 
Yes. All right. So <laughs> if you want in the middle school, in the middle of the day, to go read up on the latest Minecraft and hang out on YouTube, can you do that? No. Why not? Because there are restrictions on the iPad to stop you from doing anything on some websites and other apps that are with age restrictions. So now, the reason I say that, we could do it. We couldn't do it at home, right? Andrew, that iPad right now, you're hooked up to our Wi-Fi. Yeah. Can you go to YouTube on your iPad now? No. Uh -huh. Yeah, from the actual it. iPad, not the Wi-Fi. So we could talk about the idea of actually trying to control the media consumption so of faculty. Can I see what you're saying? So if you are trying to bring a source into the classroom, then it worked at home, it wouldn't work in the classroom. So That's one, one, sure. Or when I'm, sorry, go ahead. I don't like that. I did. I don't like that either. <laughs> <laughs> no, you just said to get faculty to be smarter. And then that's what you should do. Then you're just trying to censor what's going to do it. Then what's to stop the university from pushing their own bias by saying that faculty can only use the same sources? So let me ask you this question. <laughs> Actually, Andrew. <laughs> He's so pissed off at me now. <laughs> Andrew, what was your answer about fake news? I didn't really care about it because it didn't affect me because I don't really pay attention to the news. So what's so if you're going to go instruct faculty about the importance of fake news, I hate to break it to you, but I, there's a significant number of my faculty that will have the exact same answer. You obviously have to convince everyone that it will affect you some way, but you have to do it without their commentary. So... What I'm trying to, what I'm thinking about, and as you are beginning to think about how we put these together, is that there are a spectrum of solutions. Right? Just as the fake news side is much more complex than just it's that one website and it's bad, also the solution side of instruction also has limitations. We like to think, particularly in the university environment, this university is built on a several millennia belief that the more you know, the more capable and better the world is. And it, that's, that's the underlying value here is that we believe education is important. Right? But then the question becomes, in your example, in Andrew's example, and what you don't want to do here, I don't want to do here either, is yeah, 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 but if we can confine the instruction, we can refine the instruction. And so beginning to look at that. So, Here's another example. Let's say we don't want to go to that level. So I have a grant from the MacArthur Foundation. The MacArthur Foundation was really worried about this. And what they wanted is, all right, let me pick on another person. Steph, I gave you a question. Who is Adlai Stevenson? Remember this one? Where'd you go? Where would you go to find the answer, first off? <laughs> oh, personally? Yeah. I would go to, uh, I'd go to like a, uh, the, the Thomas Cooper online resource. Seriously? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like so many people use Wikipedia, and then they just only use Wikipedia, and it drives me nuts, so I try to avoid it. Very cool. Very cool. He likes Wikipedia. I do like Wikipedia. Yeah. I believe in Wikipedia. <laughs> well, I mean, Where did you go when I asked you this question again? Uh, Google. Google. And the idea was, now we're not going to restrict it, but imagine that little technology here, right? So Google uh, is here. Google's everywhere. But pretend for a moment it's out in California. You're here at the University of South Carolina. You make a request to Google with Adlai Stevens. I want the latest news on XYZ. And Google sends you the result. The thing is, the technology that happens, there's nothing to prevent you or South Carolina, as we saw in the filtering of what schools do, of in essence stopping that traffic and doing something with it. So they could block it. They could redirect it. They could change it. You could do it in a really subtle way so no one didn't even know. It looks like Google. It feels like Google, but in fact, it's not real. It happens all the time. It's called middleman assaults. But imagine if what happens is there's a nice little identified list of questionable sources. And every time you search Google on this campus, when you get a set of Google results, it will automatically put a nice little warning sign right next to 
a result. <coughs> Interesting. And you, before you sit there and go, no, this is horrible, or why would you do this, Google is about to do this. For any website that you bring up that doesn't have a secure connection, yes. If you have a web URL that doesn't have the secure connection, encrypted connection, they will in fact highlight the fact that it's not coming from a secure connection. If you're in Gmail, any Gmail users, you might have seen a little red thing pop up going, this is not a secure email server on the other end. Google is trying to make you more skeptical because that other stat, about the one-tenth of a second, it turns out that the more you look at it, then, yes, you're verifying it, but you get into an analysis phase. And one of the issues, and what we want to do with instruction, is we want you to get you to think about something, right? This whole two hours is bribing you with pizza so that we can make you think about something. And some of you are thinking about it, some of you are enjoying the pizza. I get that. That's fine. Right? The reason that we make you come to classes, and the first class is always some way of shocking you into paying attention. You need to know this to get an A, so we're threatening you to pay attention. Right? Or where I throw candy at you in class to, you know, I'm bribing you to pay attention. I still have your earnings, by the way. Tuesday, remind me to take care of it. <laughs> Imagine if instead of filtering, we put into an awareness system and we put it at the point of searching. Nope. Alright, give me a note. The flavors of the pencil it automatically like, oh well obviously Google knows better than I do, so it's saying Warning, so obviously I don't want to go to something that Google's giving me warning. So even though you still have the choice, the individual choice to do it, you're going to be more interested in not to do it. And then that's the information that's Does Google do that now, by the way? Um, they do some things where it's usually higher suggestion. If you're going to a really sketchy website, stop trying to download the anime. Um, <laughs> Give your phone. We try something real quick. Where's my phone? Ah, there's my phone. All right, bring up a web browser. Is that are we are we in Apple Land or are we in Android Land? Apple. Apple. So bring up Safari. Go to the top search engine. Type in Syracuse. S Y R A C U S E. Oh, it automatically default set me to Syracuse. City in New York. So what's the first result? Um, it's got the little stupid top part, which is, it's usually from Wikipedia. Yeah. Does mine look the same as yours? Oh. Why? That's not story. Uh, Personalization. I would probably say it's something like that, because on my web browser, when I pull up my computer, right. it's like that. Keep going, keep scrolling down. Keep going. Syracuse, local breaking news, okay. and then your sentence up down there, and then Syracuse University. Right. My point being, Google's already manipulating the results. Yes, based on where you are, based on who you're searched, based on whether it's logged in, based on what time of day it is, based on who paid them advertising fees, based on whether you shop. Did everyone notice that as Professor Wigan was showing us Breitbart website, the ad that was a, a belt with a knife um, buckle showed also up on Atlantic.com? I don't know what you've been shopping. What was it? I'm sorry. It was a belt, <laughs> and it had a, a, a hidden knife uh, belt buckle. The yeah. survival things. Okay, okay, I confess. <laughs> <laughs> Fake well, news. Fake right. news. <laughs> but what's it, right, you see this all the time. As you're going through the web, it's, it's, you suddenly are getting ads that are following you in a creepy kind of way. It's the same question I always have when I have any problems. Do we fix it on the individual basis or the large basis? Exactly. And that is something I can never, ever decide. Right. So what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is not to solve the problem. What I'm trying to do is get you to think about and encourage you to think about potential solutions. That those solutions can be things like instruction. And I, by the way, love instruction of faculty. I think the idea that we are holding ourselves harmless is more problematic than the idea that we say fake news is out there. Right? We're susceptible to it as much as anyone else. We already have a lot of classes about information overseas. We do. And so it's even built into the Carolina core. As undergraduates, you need to get an information literacy course. Absolutely. But as a faculty member, I didn't take an information literacy course. As a faculty member in anthropology, did they ever have a course in fake news? And frankly, here's the other issue. 
All right, we give them one in fake news, and we need to give them one in binge drinking, and we need to give them one in, and we give them one in. But those are, once again, what a student is taking, not what a professor is taking. Right? That was the, that's why I, this was an interesting twist. Well, you would assume, oh, the professor's probably going to take all this. You would assume, yeah. <laughs> yes, <thank> you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a safe assumption. Would you like to know about my college experience? Actually, mine is remarkably boring, so I'm, <laughs> I, I'm not the one to ask. But um, I, I guess the point of what I'm trying to bring up about this is there are things that you care about. You care about your own education. You care about campus. You, ha you care about your children. You care about your parents, right? So I'm, I'm at the point in life that I'm really worried. No, oh, listen, Andrew. So my stepfather loves Fox News, and it drives me freaking insane. So I get these lovely emails about, you know, how horrible the universe is, and I'm just like, I'm really worried about his, his consumption because it seems... So I'm worried about how do I do that? And ironically, they moved to a retirement community where they set up internet connections where, by the God, they filter them. <laughs> So 65-year-olds and 15-year-olds are facing the same filtering, which faces the same question as a campus educator we do, which is, are we okay with filtering? Is Who picks? What do they pick? Right? Who determines what fake news is? And particularly when, you know, what we were just, right, this is the problem that we have, is that, that here we've been told, don't, you know, don't put in opinion. Don't try to read someone's intentions. And yet, a lot of what we just talked about fake news were their intentions. And so that makes this a really thorny issue. But these are different ways. So if I could, for a moment, I'm going to ask um, Dr. Elise Lewis to come up. She's uh, also on faculty from the uh, School of Library and Information Science and just talk a little bit about if this is something you want to do something about because frankly we want you to do something about it some of the different mechanisms that you might do that I have stuff here on Discovery Hi guys! Yes, she teaches 202 and Information Literacy okay. courses. Information Literacy. So I try to um, be aware of this and keep up. How many undergrads do I have here? How many of you guys have heard of graduation with leadership distinctions? More heads should be up. Okay, so let me tell you, is anybody on track to do graduation with leadership distinctions? Are you, what's your track? Uh, global leadership. Awesome, so you're gonna travel you. abroad? Where are you going? Paris. Awesome. What semester? Um, all year next year. Fantastic, good, good. So when we talk about these issues, and we talk about problems, and not just this, but problems that you're gonna tackle throughout different courses and different curriculum, there's gonna be a component of this that you do outside of the classroom, which is considered beyond the classroom experiences. The university really pushes for these because we know it is much better for you guys to get out of the classroom than for one of us to stand up here and talk to you for three hours straight. We don't wanna do it, you don't wanna hear it. So we'll save that for grad school. It'll happen <laughs> to some extent, but it's, what you're gonna take, what you learn in the classroom, and apply it outside of the classroom, right? So give you that hands-on experience. So this is really how it works. This is how it works in the real world. The university has set up a system to reward you, for lack of a better word, but to give you credit for these experiences. And it's called Graduation with Leadership Distinctions. So there are five tracks. They just started a new one this past year. Social Justice and Diversity is the newest track. But you can do global studies, which involves study abroad. You can do professional engagement, which is an internship. You can do research, where you work with a faculty member to kind of go through this process. Uh, community service, is that five? Let's say it is. Let's say it is. Uh, so civic engagement, is that one? Mm -hmm. Civic engagement, is that the, yeah, civic and professional engagement, that's your <coughs> internship. So you go through these. Uh, there are courses that you take that are already built into most of the, your programs of study, and then you get credit for these experiences that happen outside of the classroom. In your senior year, you create a portfolio, and these are some of the most incredible portfolios I have ever seen, where you really dive into what you learned in the classroom and what you learned outside of the classroom, and you basically weave a narrative between the two. So. 
there are lots of opportunities for you to find out information about this. Um, you are required to present on Discover USC, which is coming up in the spring. But if you aren't a senior yet, you want to go ahead and get your tracking system done. So you that sounded really conspiracy, sorry. <laughs> get, get set up in, in the tracking system. Have you filled out the, have you got your information in there yet? Okay, so you can meet with advisors at USC Connect. They've got an online scheduler and you can sit down with them and say, this is what I've done. And they can say, this will count, this won't count, this is what you need to do. And you say, this is what I'm going to do. And they say, perfect, this will count, this will count, this will count. And you monitor it through your whole time in college, and then your last semester, you prepare for graduation with leadership distinctions, where you prepare this portfolio. And it's just another way to make yourself stand out. So there are, I think, 30,000 undergrad, maybe a little less right now in Carolina. Last year, 300 graduated with leadership distinctions. It does go on your transcript, it does go on your degree, and you have courts. So it's just another way to make yourself stand out among your peers and take this whole experience and show it in a meaningful way. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. USC Connect is a great office. They're the ones who do leadership distinctions. They will be able to tell you the details. I can kind of tell you some of the other information if you have questions. The Magellan Scholarship, do you have? Well, I was just going to say, um, we have flyers on the Magellan okay. Scholarship here. If you're interested, and Magellan, once again, is where you can apply for funding working with the faculty uh, mentor and do the research. But if you are going to do it, because the deadline's coming up like the 16th, there are two workshops here that you must attend in order to do that. Um, so I, we have handouts up here about that, information on the discovery date that's mentioned as well. And you just have to go to one workshop for the Magellan Scholarship. So they've got a large one that's $3,000, but they also have mini grants. So if you're not quite there for the Magellan Scholarship, go for one of the smaller grants. Okay, great way to get you guys involved outside of the classroom. And I'm going to put her on the spot, but Dr. Lewis, I'm sure, would be willing to work with you as faculty mentor. Absolutely. I'm very much willing to work with you as a faculty mentor. Professor Wigan is working as a faculty mentor. So we are very, very open to helping if you have an interest in this and moving ahead as well. All right, thank Thanks. you very much. Appreciate it. So we don't want to keep you here all the time if we need to, but perhaps I could ask you to come up and we'll just do a little sum up, summation thoughts and see if there's any interest in moving ahead on some of these things. Yeah, what do you think? These are the possible projects. One thing that I wanted to suggest, because Magellan's, it can, it can be formal research, we just establish a research question, but it, it can also be creative. It could be a creative product that, uh, that you want to, for example, create some kind of app, maybe, right. um, that, uh, that, that produces some kind of uh, interface for people who want to screen for you know, fake news or identify fake news or show them. I don't, I don't have a clue, but it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a research. It could be an actual creative product as well. But PSA, you could do you know, mm -hmm. commercial on, beware, mm -hmm. etc. I worked with a Magellan student a couple of years ago, and, and uh, he worked on a year-long project about the Palmetto Trail. And he and I worked on it together and, and created a book and a video and the whole thing. It was, it was a great project. So it doesn't just have to be research. That doesn't turn you off. But um, whatever you want to do, we're open. So. Question, comments, things about next steps. All right, we have materials up here if you want it. I think there might be some more pizza left. Feel free to take some slices to friends and neighbors. I'm going to try and get my son to forgive me by bribing him with something sweet. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks for coming.